We're going to be talking about the Android somewhat from a development standpoint, but you know, those guys here that aren't developers, I think it can be interesting for y'all too. So let's go. Out of the way. Okay. So as we said, what we're going to talk about today is Android, more specifically Android sensors. It's something that's sort of very near and dear to Greg and I's heart. We're both huge Android fans, specifically Android sensor fans, but we see all the capability, all the potential Android sensors and apps using them can really bring a rich user experience. So it's interesting, a lot of apps aren't, aren't really taking full advantage of them. <coughs> so a little bit about us, uh, Greg's a consultant, great Android developer and creator of the digital reg uh, recipe sidekick. Myself, I'm the lead Android developer for Runkeeper, it's a startup in, in Boston. And we're so passionate about Android sensors, we, we happen to write a book out, so this information will from the other book. <coughs> so the first thing we want to discuss is what's a sensor. You know, to us, a sensor is a capability that can capture measurements about the device in its external environment. So when we talk about sensors, especially for this presentation, even the book, we're talking more about just more than just what you would traditionally count as a sensor, an accelerometer or a, something that measures uh, pressure or um, temperature. It's also speech, the camera, the microphone, the location services, everything in Android that can be used to sort of pull in external data. It's all that, it's, you fuse it together, it really paints a really robust picture of what's going on in the environment outside, outside the phone. <coughs> oh, sorry. So, at any given device, there are a ton of sensors or a ton of hardware features that can be used as sensors. Cameras, microphones, the NFC scanners are new and it's uh, hopefully going to become big. Um, speech recognition, the physical sensors, as I said, the um, humidifier, not humidifier, the temperature sensor, the accelerometer, and the location sensors. Um, why use sensors? Um, because with using sensors, you can sort of make your device almost start coming alive. You can hear claps and singing and interpret it. It can see Android logos or start making sense of text. It can understand obscure spoken languages when you want to talk to your device. It can scan NFC tags, so it can start being more aware about what's around it. Um, locate a device or even um, determine device's uh, position. As I said, these help build a really rich um, experience for your user in an app. So first, we'll start by talking about the location service. It's something very near and dear to my heart, because it's what I do sort of day in, day out most of the time. Um, basically, this allows you, it allows Android to determine where you are. So the Android location service, this is the core service in the Android OS. Um, it provides a lot of location features, a lot of location capability. Amongst those, it determines device location, latitude, longitude, altitude, uh, geocoding, can take an address and transform it into an uh, um, that if you want to or vice versa. You can also, you can also set what we call proximity alerts. In other words, Android, tell me when I get within 50 kilometers of this destination. Today, we're going to primarily talk about just getting the device location. So sources of location data in Android. Android has three-ish what we call location providers. And these are things in the OS that actually give us location data. It has a network provider, which uses Wi-Fi uh, networks and the mobile cellular network to uh, give you location. GPS connector, which uses the hardware inside of the device along with the bigger GPS system to provide location information, as well as a passive provider. And that just really piggybacks on the other two. So I'm not really going to discuss passive provider here. It's sort of like a developer trick sometimes. The network provider. So this is the provider, as I said, uses MAC addresses and uh, proximity of near um, Wi-Fi access points to give you location, in addition to the mobile network. And what it does is it sort of aggregates all this information on the phone. It sends it up to, to Google's web service, and that gives you the location. I don't remember if you guys remember, a few years ago, Google got, Google got in trouble for grabbing um, Wi-Fi information. Well, that, what they were doing is, in those little cars, they had a GPS um, receiver or GPS device. And as they drove around, they were keeping track of what Wi-Fi access points they could see and how close they were, what um, cell towers they could see, and they were sort of pushing that up with the uh, actual GPS data. And they sort of maintained this. Nowadays, they don't need to do that so much anymore because each Android device will do that. If you've ever enabled the... Uh, network provider, you see the little dial right there. And essentially what that's saying is Google's going to sort of record the data so they can sort of crowdsource this information so they no longer need to send out vehicles on the roads to get um, information for their um, location service. GPS. This is standard GPS. The only difference is most Android phones use what we call a GPS or assisted GPS. The way GPS works, and I'll get into more than nitty gritty later, it's essentially you have to transmit a bunch of data to, your, to the GPS receiver before you can even start using it. Assisted GPS allows the uh, device to actually pull from the mo mobile data network, so at least it's initialized and ready to go and users are ready to use this. 
So just give a quick overview of how GPS works. This is sort of important because if you understand how it works, you understand why it has some of the problems it does. Okay? So the way GPS works, and this is just a really high level overview without all the nitty gritty details, is you have a re receiver, which is your Android device in this case, which, con which communicates with a bunch of satellites that orbit the Earth, right? The data is transmitted from the satellites to the receiver. Now, before they start transmitting this data, they sort of synchronize time, so basically the satellite and the receiver know, have the uh, synchronized clocks. And the satellite marks with time and starts sending the data, sends a known length of data down to the uh, receiver. So the receiver has the time it took, and also has the, has the, uh, has the time, it just has the time it took, and the, not the distance of travel. The, the speed, sorry, the speed. It. It's the speed because we can just sort of assume it's the, um, how fast radio signals travel through the air, through a vacuum. So with the time and the speed, we have the distance. You have distance to multiple satellites, and you can triangulate to find the uh, location on the Earth. So because of the way this works, there are a lot of problems with GPS. One of them are environmental conditions, thick vegetation can interrupt the signal as it comes down from the satellite. Atmospheric conditions, if there's gas in the atmosphere, well, obviously radio signals travel slower through gas and through vacuum. Um, a big one I've seen is the quality of the GPS hardware in a phone. Some phones are notorious for getting a, a slow fix, and that's because the manufacturer put in cheap radios. So my, uh, one of my colleagues, his wife had a phone that every time she launched the GPS app, it would take up to five minutes to get a fix, and that's just because of bad hardware. Also, a big problem with GPS is you need a clear line of sight to the sky, so it's unlikely to work indoors. In, uh, in a city like Boston or any urban area, you have what we call multipath problems. The multipath problem is, is when the data from the satellite to the receiver takes two different paths to get from <coughs> point A to point B. So since we're relying on timing to sort of make these calculations of signals are bouncing off uh, buildings or canyons or whatever, it takes a different path and therefore it's like a different, different um, amount of time it takes the data to travel and that just causes the GPS to go haywire. So if you're ever in like a city and your GPS is jumping, it could barely be because of the multi path. Just a quick comparison. Um, of the network versus the GPS provider. The, the main takeaway from this is each provider sort of has its strengths and weaknesses, especially if you're a, a developer. Um, the GPS gives you a, um, really accurate um, location information, however, consumes a lot of battery life, and that's really key to users. It also can be really slow to get that first fix, which means if you want, right now, the user launches it, and they're just sort of sitting there waiting. They're totally blocked. They're going to sit there and wait until they get the fixed, and that can take minutes sometimes. The network provider has its place because it takes a lot less battery because you're not firing up extra hardware. Chances are, like the you know, Wi-Fi radio is already on, so it's a mobile radio, and it also gives you a first fix really, really quickly. The downside is the accuracy is not nearly as good as in GPS. This is just sort of a little dabble in the, the uh, sort of developer side for people who are developers. There's a few permissions you need to ask for if you want to use any location stuff. So if ever you're downloading the Android app, you start popping up things like access course or access file. And what they're asking for is what little level of granularity do you want to grant an app to, to provide um, location information. So fine is obviously for GPS course is the net provider. If you ask for fine, you can use both of them because you know because the GPS is going to find more accurate information than the provider. So let's go through a quick little demo. I'll just show you how this sort of works and some of the problems. This is just an app that uh, Greg and I wrote to help us get a handle on some of the sensor stuff. If you can see it there. Right. You can move that light. You might be better off without the light. Yeah. That's fine. So this is just to sort of demonstrate the problems with the different providers, right? <coughs> so what this app really does is just grab a first fix. So this isn't really processing the information other than just reading it. It's just sort of... Uh, it makes the screen better if the camera's not uh, that close to the device. Right. There's a switch for that light. That's good. That's good? Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do here, 
Because what this shows is we actually got a, a, a location fix from the, the uh, network provider. It took one second with an accuracy of 27.727 meters. That's actually not very good. The GPS provider can often get an accuracy of um, five, even sometimes below five meters. Um, what we can do here is also demonstrate that the GPS just sort of doesn't work, right? So if we just turn off the, uh, the network provider, this is how you enable, the user can enable and disable the providers. And go back, we're going to sit here forever. Notice the uh, system, the system tray icon kind of upper left hand corner, just sort of sitting there. We'll wait here forever because we're indoors and obviously can't see satellites. And we're not going to get uh, any GPS points. Not a real exciting demo, but we'll be more later on. So now I'm going to dive into just a little bit of code. I'm just going to sort of stay high level. And the only reason I'm introducing it is because we want to access uh, sensor information from both location or physical sensors. You sort of take the same approach in for both, both ways. So I won't get into too deep into because I don't know how into that the actual Android code people are. So the location service in Android, for those who don't know Android, most Android apps are written in Java. There's basically four components you need to use. The location manager, which is the interface to the system service. A location listener, which provides callbacks for when the location service wants to send you information. Uh, the location, which is the model object for the actual location data, and what they call a location provider, which is just the abstraction for the different location providers. So to implement in Java a location list, there's four methods you got to um, implement. The one that we tend to use a lot is the onLocation change. That's the method that gets called when Android has a new location to give you. Now this is sort of a key takeaway. You can't really ask for a location in Android. You just tell Android, give me a location when you have one. So that's why if you use a GPS provider and the, the apps expect it to work indoors, the user's just going to sit there because you're going to have nothing, to, you're going to get nothing. Your app could potentially just hang there and put up a smell and have to dismiss. The other, the other methods, provider enable, disable, get fired when the user enables or disable the location provider. And status change provides status information about location providers. So once you implement that interface, there's three things you need to do. You need to register with the location manager to get location updates, process the data in the on location change method, and then unregister. And that unregistered part for both the location and the physical sensors is very important. Because what you're essentially doing <coughs> when you register is you're firing up additional hardware. Every time you fire up more hardware, you use more battery. And of course, battery life is something very key to every user. So if you forget to unregister, the, the hardware is going to stay hot and you're just going to suck battery. Nowadays, there's a lot of apps out there that not hear that. And sort of using that is a good way to get your app uninstalled. Quick low code. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with the life, the life cycle methods in Android. Essentially, not create method for like an activity, which most of the time represents a screen, is the first method that gets called. So in this method is where we get the handle to the location manager. Very simple to access the uh, system service. Here's where we start processing data. In this case, all we're doing is accessing the data from within that location object that we are handed. The altitude, the latitude, the longitude, and the accuracy. Computing a little, a little algorithm to compute the how much time it took, and then just removing the updates. So the a API is actually fairly simple to use. And that's sort of another takeaway. In both for both location and physical sensors, accessing the data is not that hard. And making sense of it is a lot more complex. So the summary for, for location is that there are multiple sources of data. The API is fairly simple to use, and requesting. And again, when anytime you fire more hardware to request location data can drain the battery. Um, the choice of location provider really depends on what you want to do with it. In most cases, you actually come to an algorithm that uses both. You first grab a data, piece of data from the network provider, and then as, you get, as a GPS provider comes online, you start using that, and then you have algorithms that sort of determine which one is better based on accuracy. Next, we're going to talk about physical sensors. And this is what I think most people think of when they when I say sensors. Again, thermometer, humidity sensor, things like that. And these were they, these are the things that a lot of people really aren't using. A lot of apps aren't using. I was watching a uh, Google I/O video actually actually had Android engineers using their own physical sensors API, and they thought it was actually difficult. And they were surprised that more apps don't use it because it really can add so much data, so much data into your app. So, the title of this is allowing Android to sense its place in the world. So the reason, one of the reasons I'm so psyched about sensors in Android is previously sensors were sort of separate pieces of hardware. You had to sort of put them together yourself, integrate them yourself. And it wasn't really easy to get these data fusion algorithms working with the hardware. 
nowadays, if you think about the device, it could have had maybe 15 different sensors on it. It fits in the palm of your hand, in your pocket, and travels with your user all day long. I mean, when I think about my own smartphone usage, my smartphone really never leaves my side. So all day long, I could be collecting data if I wanted to. You start to make sense of that. And using this sensor data really allows you to start injecting this sort of contextual information into your, your algorithms to, to really build a really powerful app. So when we're developing with Android sensors, me, there are sort of two classes of sensors. And this is actually really important. You have the hardware sensors, which give you the raw data from the, from the actual hardware. It's unfiltered, it's, as you would see off of any, um, any sensor, you, any other sensor external to the phone. Um, these also, each one of these in, in, the, in the SDK represents an actual physical sensor on the device. And you have the software sensors, which are the synthetic or, or uh, virtual sensors. Now, what the Android developers have done is sort of built the virtual sensor layer on top of the hardware sensor layer. What that allows them to do is perform sensor fusion algorithms or do some filtering. It just makes it a lot more easy for app developers to digest it. If you've ever worked with sensor data before, especially Android, they're very <coughs> noisy and the values sometimes you can't rely on. Well, this allows you know, some of these developers who just work with like accelerometers to sort of help you out. And it can even be you know, um, a virtual sensor that uses other hardware components on top of the, uh, hardware, uh, the uh, hardware sensors. Another key takeaway here is different devices may have a slightly different implementation of these software sensors, but you sort of access everything the same way. And for the most part, you shouldn't really care about the actual implementation, sort of a black box. So just an example here of a hardware versus a software center, sensor. What we have here is um, an accelerometer and a linear acceleration sen sensor. And the accelerometer is the hardware sensor and the linear acceleration sensor is the software sensor. They both sort of measure the same thing, um, the, the force of acceleration, right? the amount of acceleration in any given direction. Now what we see, well first of all, this plot was taken with the device laying flat on its back like it was not moving. And what we see with the accelerometer data raw accelerometer data. So you can see the device is not moving. We have a z-axis that's maintaining a value of around 10, 9.8 meters per second, for to gravity. <laughs> and an x-axis that's slightly below zero, even though the device is not moving a line flat on its back. Right? Now, the same thing with the linear acceleration sensor. It knows, knows the, uh, it's already factored out the force due to gravity, and it's also quiet the noise. Now with this one, these both are, I have not, the code does not process the data at all. So the hardware sensors, even the raw data, the software sensors, doing some of the heavy lifting for you. So again, when you have a choice, always prefer the software sensor. It'll make your life a lot easier. I'll get into why, which axis is which a little bit later. And if we wanted to, to make the uh, hardware sensor do the same thing, we just have to provide a filtering algorithm. So this again is the raw data, and then I'd write extra code to perform some filtering. And as you can see, until the filter sort of got initialized. <coughs> We're sort of not at zero. Whereas with the linear acceleration sensor, just use the just use the data gate. So types of sensor data. So sensor data can for the most part be thrown in three large buckets. Environmental data, which is data about the external environment, uh, motion data, which is data for determining and detecting motion, and position data, how the phone is positioned um, relative to the planet. So environmental sensors. Now when I start listing these sensors, it's important to remember that not every device has every sensor. For some of these, like the, uh, the atmospheric pressure sensor, that's actually a new sensor only on some newer devices. So you can't count on a sensor being available on every single device. There are a certain subset that are usually available, but Android allows you to sort of query to see what's there. So some of the environmental sensors that we tend to use are the ambient temperature, which gives you room temperature, ambient light, which measures illumination, Atmospheric pressure, which is one of the newer ones, it's actually cool with that. You can start to get <coughs> into it. Uh, air humidity and device temperature. The device temperature I list there just to be thorough. It's actually not really used because it measured hardware device or uh, hardware temperature, so it would be in different spots and different phones. It's really sort of useless. So the Android developers have actually uh, deprecated it in favor of ambient temperature. It'd be nice, like a CPU type of thing, if it was consistent across devices. So let's just look at um, some live sensor data. So what we can see here. <coughs> so we've got two different phones. So there's an area in the app where it just lists every single sensor you see on the device. So you can see on my Galaxy Nexus, there are a fair amount of sensors. 
accelerometer, the pressure sensor, a gyroscope, magnetic field, a bunch of them. Uh, the Galaxy Nexus, this is the GSM version, is not, it's about a year old, I guess it's really old, but compared to other phones like the Thunderbolt and Watch, it's really not that old. Contrast that to my Thunderbolt, which has a much smaller list of sensors. So again, I mean, that's one thing to keep in mind whenever you want to sort of work with sensors, you can't rely on any specific sensor being available. So you can sort of specify, if you really want to, you can specify what we call the Android manifest, what has to be there, but <coughs> so when you can download your app and often it's not a very good idea, you better off just cutting the function down. You can raise your camera a little higher than I think the entire device, but you need a little bit of a screen up. Look at some of the boring light sensor. So what we have here is a screen that just sort of shows what type of data you can get out of the sensor. There we go. Right. So there's essentially you can control how often you want Android to give you sensor data. That's that uh, radio buttons on top. I'm just going to leave it at uh, UI no, at delay normal now. That's sort of a developer thing for <coughs> sensor data. The interesting part is actually the bottom half of the screen under the second separator. So what we have here is the name of the sensor, the type, the range, the, the maximum data, the maximum value that it can collect, the minimum delay, the power consumption, the resolution, basically, how the granularity of what, of what, can, what it can detect in a change in value, and even some uh, vendor information, right? So there's actually, there's actually a decent amount of information outside just the value. And for this light sensor, actually located up on by the earpiece. And if I put my finger on the sensor, you can actually see the value start to fluctuate a little bit. Right. And again, we're just reading the data, not doing anything with it. This is just the first step you need to take in order to, to uh, process sensor data. It also gives you sort of a timestamp. The same thing with the pressure sensor. It just gives you ambient pressure, so there's nothing really for you to do with that. Next group of sensors are the motion sensors. These are your accelerometer, which is uh, gives you force and direction of acceleration over a three, uh, three axis accelerometer. Uh, gravity, this is a software sensor. And what gra the gravity sensor does, if you remember my earlier slide where we actually had the accelerometer data had gra gravity factored in, the gravity software sensor actually factors that out and gives you just the <coughs> So you can tell by, if you rotate your phone, you can tell which way the phone is facing based on which pulling, what axis is pulling in the gravity. And then there's the linear acceleration sensor, which is also a software sensor, and that gives you just the pure acceleration. So it's almost like if you combine the gravity and the linear acceleration sensor, you have the raw accelerometer sensor. Again, the linear acceleration just filters out the data to give you the raw acceleration, so you really don't have to do anything. It's really, really, really clean to use. And two more sensors, the gyroscope, which gives you rotation and rotation vector. Again, the software sensor that so it takes the gyroscope the raw data and makes it just a little bit easier to use. So the important thing to keep in mind when you're doing the Android sensors are the, the coordinate systems. There's two coordinate systems we use based on the type of sensor you're using. The device coordinate system and the global coordinate system. The device coordinate system um, graphic is sort of uh, self-explanatory. The y-axis comes out the top, the x-axis comes out the side, and the z-axis comes out the uh, is the uh, front of the phone, which is why when we had the phone laying flat, we were getting um, at, um, accelerometer down the z-axis because that's the axis that was affected. The global, global coordinate system is a little more difficult to um, determine from the graphic. The y-axis points north, the x-axis points east, and the z-axis points out from the center of the earth. That'll become clear. So let's just go to a, another part of our app, and this is an app that detects um, movement. Now this is. Sort of interesting because this is a gesture I'm starting to see crop up more and more, the shake. So more and more apps are allowing me to shake to, to, let the, to let the user tell the app that it wants to do something. I've seen a shake to uh, start playing music or shake to, to you know, enforce for what I think it perform check-in, there's a bunch of things. And this is sort of how they're doing it. So let's go to the different part of the app. Detect movement, right. So again, we can use either the linear acceleration uh, sensor or the accelerometer to do this. So let's just turn that off in a second. And just use the accelerometer data. And as you can see, it's hard to see on the, on the screen, but in the very top of the screen is 
the, the light blue bar is actually the total acceleration, which is 9.8, and it's tough to see because it's being overlaid, but the, uh, the z-axis is also up at 9.8, right? And if you start to rotate this, uh, you can start to see the different um, axes being affected. And then we shake it, <coughs> you can start seeing there's a magic happen. And again, contrast that, the linear acceleration sensor, we have all zeros to begin with. Can you control the sample rate? Yes. That, so that the previous screen when I had the delays, that's the sample. You can even pass in on a custom value. Again, if we just apply a high pass filter to the accelerometer data, we've got what starts to look like the, the, uh, the linear acceleration um, sensor. And if we turn the speech on, we can start determining if there's movements. Right. So essentially, you just take the sensor data, you take this, uh, you start processing the, the, the different accelerations together, and then you have the, the total acceleration that you can key off. And then you can start determining how vigorously you want the user to start shaping the, uh, the device. But this, this app was actually sort of really useful for me to start seeing how things affected the different sensor data. Group. These are your magnetic field sensor, geomagnetic field, um, proximity, how far something is from the screen, and the orientation. And this is a software sensor, but it's sort of deprecated. There's other ways of doing this that Google has sort of built in that you want to be using instead of the orientation sensor. Or mainly the gravity sensor, there's other, um, uh, other methods of like the <coughs> rotation matrix, and then there's code they have that sort of will process that for you. So the proximity sensor is actually sort of interesting here. Back to our sensor list here. So what's interesting here is right now with nothing against the screen, it's recording a distance of uh, five centimeters, right? And of course, when I put my finger over the proximity center, sensor, it's giving me a, a distance of zero. So what this is, it's what we call a binary sensor. Even though it's giving you a value, it's just representing a binary state. It's either something near or something's far. And that's just one of the paradigms that they use that you got to sort of watch out for. Certain sensors, even though they're giving a value of 5, it's not really 5. So it's often important to know which sensors do that, which sensors don't. Let's look at another demo. So detecting orientation. As I said, there is that orientation sensor, which is a software sensor that's deprecated because you can use some of these other sensors to do the same thing. What sensor status unreliable? So, for, for a binary sensor, it's always going to give you that, simply because it's the, you can't really trust the value. So here we go, again, this is going to tell us whether or not the uh, device is face up or face down. So we turn the device over. Face down. Face up. Face up. Right? Very, fairly simple. Now, with the gravity, as I said, the gravity center just provides the, uh, the gravity on the X, Y, and Z axis. So as we start tilting it up on the short side, we'll start seeing <coughs> as we get start seeing the y, the X axis values go increase. Um, you can see that it's very. It's only goes up to one here. We're not tilting it all the way up. If we start affecting the, the Y axis, of course. Same thing, we can use the accelerometer and the, the sensor the magnetic field sensor, the gravity sensor, the magnetic field sensor, or the rotation vector. Now, these are all sort of really trivial problems that don't solve much. They just are geared toward getting people's feet, getting specifically my feet up using the sensors in the first place. A more interesting application would be what we call the North Finder app. Now, this could be the basis of like an augmented reality app, right? Essentially, you've got your phone up, you're looking for something, and as you view into your screen, the world is seen sort of differently, right? And what this does is it um, paints the screen green when you come within 20 degrees of north, paints the screen red otherwise. 
don't know if we'll do this on the screen. Probably not. It's actually the camera. The color reflects off your shirt. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, this one just uses the uh, the rotation vector sensor and it does what we call remap the the, uh, the coordinate plans, which is so it's um, detecting the camera facing you. As I said, the code for it, if we ever want, if you want, it's actually online. But it's sort of the basis for how you can do the augmented reality stuff. So Using sets, just using purely sensors. That's how, again, some of these games are, are putting all their stuff off. But, but where does the calibration come from? Does it come from the magnetic field? Or? Yes. Okay. And you can, so that's another, you can sort of recalibrate. So magnetic fields sort of can get like nasty. And sometimes you have to have you know, your user do the figure eight type of thing. Yeah. And sometimes you sort of just built that into your app. And you can sense things getting real funky, or the user senses it. You say, well, calibrate me, and you sort of walk them through. Doing the figure. I actually have an app on my phone called GPS Dash where he does that. He says basically the, the compass, as he calls it, goes haywire to the figure eight. And that's something you sort of battle with is how do you calibrate these things when you really think user interaction? I mean, I, I, is there software in Android that kind of does fusion between the rotation sensors and the accelerometers and the, and the compass sensor? Because obviously, you know, if you're in the presence of the strong magnetic field, they're going to be different. And at some, to some degree, maybe you can do like an INS type of thing where it, it guesstimates the orientation even if the magnetic field points in a different direction. Correct. And that's what sort Is of it built in or do you have to do that yourself? Somewhat in the software senses, but they don't go to that level. With that, which means you need to start bringing your own algorithms. You know, and isn't that, that's really the trick with, with sensor work anyway, right? It's not necessarily accessing the data, but making sense of that. So that's, there's, you know, whole books for that. <laughs> No, just the prop. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> and we're talking about problems with sensor data. These are a lot of the things you have to overcome if you're going to process sensor data. Things like drift, you know, again, the force of gravity, um, the noise. Again, sometimes you'll be watching sensor data and all of a sudden you see a spike. Almost always you use a filter now where you're on um, zero offset or a bias. Um, time delays can also be a big one. If the device gets really, really busy, you can actually start dropping things on the floor. Some um, techniques for handling the, the sensor information, re-zeroing the calibration, like in the magnetic sensor to the figure eight. Uh, sensor fusion, some, again, some of the software sensors start doing this for you, but if you want to start combining accelerometer data and gyroscope data, the product becomes really powerful. Uh, filters, low pass, high pass, especially for the accelerometer data, again, you know, provide a filter, and sort of takes care of things for you. And again, using uh, the use of the software sensors, because they, they will do some of this out of the box. So in summary, uh, this has been some, just the whirlwind presentation. Uh, Android provides multiple different sensors that have to utilize. Always prefer software sensors over hardware sensors if you can. And the API is a very similar pattern to the, the location API. I didn't know the details, but essentially you access the system service, you create your listener, register a process, then unregistered the exact same pattern as you go through it. And after you, uh, after you access the sensor data is when the real work begins. It's making sense of it. It's real part. That's it for me. And then Greg is going to talk to you about all things speech and yeah. NFC. Can I ask a question now? Yeah. What, so, uh, could you oh, give sorry. us like your favorite application demonstrating each type of different sensor that, uh, you know, the shape and the face and the... I, I didn't catch the beginning of it. Sort of uh, your favorite applications that are out there that demonstrate the use of these sensors. So, uh, GPS is kind of obvious because it's... Yeah. Well, what about the other ones like yeah, you know, NFC or... NFC, maybe I don't use much NFC, so maybe he uh, yeah, could seen, talk to that. I haven't seen a lot of NFC yeah. There was, there was a, an app that used sensors that I thought it was really cool. Uh, uh, using it as like a, a level. And if they were also using like a camera, they were determining distance and, and measurements. I, unfortunately, I forgot the name of the app. It's actually a really clever app. Um, get, actually, games use a lot of the sensor data to uh, record the input. <coughs> so that's what yeah, I said. I had a driving game one time. You actually turned the phone. And that's, that's what he did. So a lot of the real like cutting edge work seems to be in uh, the, the game development area. Any other questions? Um, how does the proximity sensor work? What's, how can I tell the proximity to an object? Oh, yeah, I, 
at one point knew all the hairy details of that, ultrasound, but I don't know. Ultrasound, maybe? <laughs> it's not ultrasound, but I don't, I don't remember the details anymore. It's one of those things it's I just It's an iron leg and a, and a photo sensor. Yeah. It just looks for the reflection. So the light, the light the uses the light sensor to... No, it's, it wasn't it's, a software sensor, was it? It's, it's a hardware sensor, but it doesn't use it doesn't use the actual light sensor. It's, it's right. a separate yeah. it's a separate photo diode or, or photo transistor that just yeah. looks for the reflection from the, the light. And so it's only good for one angle of the phone or the yeah. object. Yeah. It's meant to tell when your phone's against your ear. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, and I think the light pulses too. Uh, exactly. Anything else? I think that's where I guess. Hmm? Okay. Continue questions later. Sure. Uh, Sensing playground again. That's my favorite sensing. Yeah. <laughs> For all. Uh, I have the Nexus S. Nexus 7. Is that app on the Play Store? Yep. Yeah. And actually, all the codes can get up. Yeah. Hmm. to continue the whirlwind. I'm going to cover the other uh, important sensors. Uh, audio, camera, speech recognition, and this. Movement has been detected. <laughs> I'm not covering it. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to press the presentation. Yes. Okay. Because the most phone, most phones have like a microphone on them. Uh, it's very used to make calls. Um, some of the uh, some of the like leader type Nook well, uh, Nook Android devices and things like that don't have one. But for those that do, um, we can readily use apps can readily use those things to uh, to do stuff. And there's two kinds of data that's available to apps. There's, um, there's amplitude of the audio recording, so you can get a reading of how loud the sound is at any particular time. And then if that's not good enough, you can go get access to the raw audio, and then you can apply your favorite signal processing algorithm to that as well. So uh, one idea is you can make the equivalent of an Android clapper. Some people, you remember? Does anyone remember the, the, the clapper? Sure. How can you forget the clapper? <laughs> so the clapper would respond to a clap by turning on and off electrical sockets. But if we implement a clapper on Android, it could, uh, you could use it to sort of signal Android to do something. And that's very easy to implement when you can measure the amplitude. So if you detect like a high volume, you've heard a clap. So to do that, Android provides this object called a media recorder. And there's one method. There's one method that, you call, that apps can call, and it just gets the max amplitude at the current time since the last time this thing was called. So what you do is you set up this loop. So it starts off where you or media recorder, and then you start looping, you wait, then you get the maximum food, then you process it, you know, you check to see if the volume is higher, high enough to be considered a clap, for example, and keep looping. It's very, very simple to, to implement. If you want the recorded audio, you can get access to this kind of thing. But this is, um, this is a, a recording of me singing to my Android that I, that I recorded on the Android device. So using that, if you got access to this, you can make some really interesting apps like a guitar tuner, if you have the right, the right algorithm. One of the algorithms you might use is to, it's called root and square, which will help you 
break, uh, determine the average volume of a particular signal. And another thing you might, another kind of signal processing you might do is estimating frequency. So for that, for that guitar tuner, it's what you'd have to do. You'd have to try to estimate the frequency of the signal. And this algorithm that I, uh, I'm going to show you is called zero crossings. And you can kind of get a sense for how it works. It's very intuitive. Um, like for this signal, you can count up how many times it crosses the X, uh, yeah, this axis. And every two times it's a cycle. And if you know how long the signal is, you can get an estimated frequency. So that's the way zero crossings works. It really only works when you got like a clean signal like this. When you have that other signal I had showed you earlier, it's kind of it doesn't really do got do a good job of getting an accurate signal, but it does characterize the audio in a certain way, such that you can you can use this algorithm to detect whether or not someone's doing this, this like singing versus when they're just talking, versus when they're hearing anything. And you can use that to make a singing fiber. So I'd like to demonstrate those two clapper things, if I could. So this is just um, this is going to demonstrate those two algorithms: root mean squared and um, zero crossings. So whenever I get louder, the volume goes up, 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 up. There was like eight thousand right there, and the frequency is kind of goes all around based on what I've said. What, what, what's hearing? Well, it's staying around 600. So, if I'm if I were to sing a tone, you should see this frequency stabilize somewhat. <coughs> Do. It's looking for the color green in the image. So we have your red apples not showing up down here. <laughs> green apples showing up down, showing up over here. Right? And this can be done. This can be done using just the, the, the camera on Android. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how how you can do that. There's really a there's a kind of a bunch of of details that app has to take care of. So it's going to do some image image processing. First, it has to control the camera. Uh, one thing that the cameras on the phone do is that they have this autofocus feature. So as you move around the phone, things are going in and out of focus. And so the app has to decide when the picture is in just the right focus when you should you know, start looking at it. Um, and then it has to work with different phone hardware, which has cameras in all kinds of different locations, different spots on it. And phones that can be rotated in different orientations, so it can be hard to tell like which way is, what is up. Like for example, if you were doing like character recognition, that would probably be important. 
consideration. Um, let's see, then you have to do some processing to make the image smaller. If you, if you have, like these cameras on the phone, they're actually really good. You could get like a thousand by a thousand pixel image out of your phone, right? But then, now you have an algorithm that has to process a thousand times a thousand pixels of data. And as soon as you start doing that, it's going to be <coughs> too slow, even for, you know, the quad core processor that's on here. So there's a bunch of techniques that, you know, make, you know, convert the image to a different format that's more efficient, or convert it to black and white. And then after you've sort of soft your image through this pipeline, then you can start running some interesting function problems. Can you tell the camera to actually focus to a given distance, or do you, can you just turn the auto focus on and off? It's just on and off. So you can't tell it that's what I want. Nope. <laughs> there is a there is a close up <laughs> mode. So here's an example of a pipeline. Uh, oh, I just wanted to mention this. This is all these steps I was just talking about sound like kind of really complex and difficult, but really what it just turns into you take your image processing library and all the functions are there, and you're just trying to string them together to get whatever particular kind of result you want. So this code here is part of a sequence of library calls, right? Like, so the first one takes an image and it's going to compute the difference between every pixel and the color green. Okay. So then, once it has that, it's going to apply a threshold. So anything that is like really green is going to keep, anything that is not green at all is going to and throw away and that's going to become zero. So that the result there is you have basically a black and white image where white is and really green things in image, right? So what can you use that for? Well, there are these like, you know, handy green logo, right? So theoretically what I could do here is I can start up of these uh, maybe that green detector. I don't know if I, see <coughs> if I put an Android logo there. See how it shows up? <laughs> Just the Android logo is showing up. Oh, you see that rectangle? Yep. And there's another algorithm that's trying to locate the like the biggest chunk of the green and put this rectangle around it, but it's having a hard time. And then there are many androids everywhere. And then, of course, it can also detect other, other ones too. Other logos <laughs> that happen to be green. <laughs> Depending on what you want to do. Okay, so those those two things I think are really awesome. They they help the uh, Android become more aware. Um, any questions about those two before I go? Are those Android libraries or are they supplemental from Java? Or something? They they're from Java, and some of them have um, loads too, <laughs> but they they kind of have like an Android specific version of the Java library, which is a version of the C library. <laughs> you put things like QR codes or for character recognition, do those exist? Have, have you seen those? Ones? Those are separate. There's a, like an open source QR code reader library for Android. Is there an API for like Google goggles that you can send an image to and you know, ask it, what is this, or OCR this for me? Or? I wish. No. Have you heard of something like that? Soon. The what? I don't know. <laughs> but I have 
haven't seen a lot of apps actually use this kind of thing. The only, the only place I've seen the image processing a lot is like for robots. I think robots need to do that. You're an Android controlled robot. <coughs> All right. Um, let's go on to my favorite topic. Speech tracking. So we consider the speech recognition another kind of sense. It's a specific kind of thing that Android can sense. The goal is to understand things that people are speaking, and there are lots of different design challenges and implementation challenges that I just want to <coughs> talk about recognizing hard to recognize words. So let's see, when you're, an app wants to kick off a speech recognition request, they're going to execute these three lines of code, which allows an app to specify certain parameters, like a prompt. They may, you know, it can also specify like a language and a bunch of other things. You set up your intent that you want the Android to start doing speech recognition. And then Android starts off a process of beeping and dialogues that walks the user through the speech recognition. And it's kind of a nice thing that people are used to, used to seeing. So there's this, there's a um, prompt and then after the user speaks, it goes into like a, a working state where the you know, recorded audio is going back to uh, Google servers and then it comes back with a list of possible things you might have said. Or one of these three error conditions. And it's nice, it allows this process allows them to like retry, this says speak again. Uh, retry it. Um, and even the beeps are there to, to sort of uh, give almost a hands-free, eyes-free kind of So speech recognition actually requires the internet to access the Google servers? Yes. That did change in Jellybean. In <coughs> Jellybean, they, they allow it to download it. Okay. Yes, and that's not available to us mortal human right. beings yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there's Only no API to the local recognition, either in Jellybean? No. Okay. That's <laughs> I think Google, Google does that sometimes. They did that with the map API. Yeah. They had special powers in their mapping tools and we didn't get access to that for years. But yeah, it requires it again. It's not that slow though. Uh, and then Here's the code that gets the recognition results. There's a list of strings. That's the list. And your code goes there. Uh, you know, a lot of your code goes there. <laughs> um, you know, copy and paste from our code library. Um, OK, so <clears throat> here's the challenge. Uh, here's a set of recognition results. Does anyone guess like, what I was trying to say? <laughs> Does anyone guess what I was trying to say? You know, cooking, cooking related. Cumin. 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 <laughs> That's right. I was trying to say how much cumin. Uh. <laughs> I okay. I get. I get it. Cumin's not like the most popular spice out there, right? But um, it still should recognize that word. But for some reason, the speech recognizer just doesn't just assumes that. Chances are no one's ever going to say human, so we're going to make it like really low priority and never recognize it, which is a problem if you have like a recipe app, right? <laughs> does it does you know if the speech recognizer is just word at a time, or does it try to do any kind of grammar or semantic checking to infer the words? Oh, I have no idea what it does behind the scenes, but you know it's you, you speak a sentence and it tries to give you it gives you. Possibilities for what you just said. Can you, you can't, give it a you can't get Can it? you tell it no. that you know this is a cooking app and therefore you know you should change the vocabulary you expect? There's one hint and it, it's not clear like how useful it is. You can tell it you're doing uh, free text or you can tell it you're doing web search terms. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and, and it should be obvious to you which one you should pick. Right. But I can't really. 
a much higher error rate and over a short period of time it, it learns for me. Um, but have you ever picked like another option that you didn't mean to say yeah. watch, you meant to say wash? That's right. I, or sometimes I'll correct it by typing and then, you know, the next day it will get it right the it first time. Nice time. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, maybe this API is the best thing Simple. Are those are those corrections then to it? Those optimizations of that algorithm are those local? Or are those also probably? I don't know. I mean, since you get back this yeah. list, right? Like, here's what you might have said. You could present a you know selection box for that word to the user. And but when you're doing like a Speech command. There's comes and you have some rare words like human. There's like the speech recognizer is like just not good enough. Like it just won't recognize human at all. So there's some there's some uh, algorithms to use that that can help. Uh, phonetic matching. So there's human. Um, phonetic matching. Converts a word, a string, into its representation. <coughs> that it's supposed to represent how it sounds. So this this algorithm takes the first letter, and then after that, each number represents a certain sound. The word sound, right? So human is C five five zero, but also this pronunciation, this spelling of human, and canon, and canon, hmm. but not so uh, if the recognizer just heard canon, presumably your recipe app could still figure out the next So it gives you back these codes? No, this is this is processing that the app has to do. Right? So you just get back the words, right? The app gets back this. So you have to look up these codes in the dictionary. And then I can then the app can just compute all the codes and try to figure out what it's So you have to so look up those process. codes in a dictionary. Yeah. I see. yeah. Which you have local. Well, it's not it's not a dictionary, it's a, like a set of like ten rules. If you see a U in a word, the, the code is five. If you see an M, the code is five. But English pronunciation is a lot more complicated than we're capturing. Well, those, those are sound codes. Sound codes. Yeah. yeah. Which is just it's completely textual. Oh, okay. It's just, this is like this. This is comes from the ancient algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's other ones, right? But um, but I find it works really well. This is the one I use in my app. This the other side is um, is an instance of hominins. So if 
I was trying to say time is spice. Android's most likely going to give me back time the time the clock <laughs> clock time instead as a higher higher likelihood. Right? But it also usually gives you back um, the hominid or most hominids. Did no. Google do any sort of contextual stuff? So if I said like add the time to the fixing bowl, is it like really they probably don't mean the I am no. part of it? I wouldn't be surprised. They have huge processing yeah. capabilities. Do you have control as a developer of the size of the speech snippets that you send to Google for analysis? Can you control, because if you just send them one word at a time, it would have no context. But presumably if you get the whole sentence with the context, it might be able to do a smarter recognition. Yeah, you can specify how much chunk so you can record maximum. Right. But they also might not be doing that because they got to compute this really fast. You must be the developer to figure out what they said. <laughs> um, let's try that. about to put some time in my mixing bowl and put it in the oven. Okay, so I didn't get it, right? <laughs> well, actually it got exactly what I said, but it put the wrong, the wrong time in there. Right? Oh, so you're all free in the rest oh, of the <laughs> <laughs> How about some cumin in my recipe? Uh-oh. Whoa. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> First uh, one. What? Uh -oh. what? <laughs> what? That's not as dumb as you said. Start, start, start. Uh-oh. Start, man. Get to Oh, gosh. That's not good. Uh, that's not good for the kids. Censored. <laughs> that's not good for the kids. <laughs> It's not easy to recognize each. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess that's the end. I get, I'll do one more. Um, Does it happen uh, to the delay too long, or just batteries run low? Definitely <laughs> not my fault. The battery. Definitely. <laughs> 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 You're right. So when the battery's low, it recognizes you. <laughs> All right, so this is, um, uh, I got time. This is just um, an example of a more uh, complicated dialogue you can implement. So, uh, apples. Apple. <laughs> Red apples? Well, see, that was interesting because it says it? It, it didn't recognize red at all. It mean apple? Mean apple. But, uh, you know, I had that phonetic matching going on, so I was able to match that. Okay, and then I do edit. Add pizza. How many calories for pizza? 5,000. Added pizza with 5,000 calories. <laughs> pizza. Pizza has 5,000 calories. That's a So it's possible to string together some interesting short little dialogues, but... Uh, well, what's the number to the right of each term? Oh, this is a confidence value. And it has zero on the other two? Yeah, that's... Uh, a bug I've submitted to Google. <laughs> it's supposed to be a confidence for each one, but you only get it for the first. <laughs> uh, blah, 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 blah. Tomato has 20 
Sticker type. It's like circle sticker, square sticker. There's like stickers with logos on them, big rectangle ones, and then there's this one. It's a, it's like a washer. It looks like a washer. And um, and this one's like supposed to be able to survive a washer. Right. <laughs> That's how you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I haven't tried it yet. Um, okay, and then, so besides the form factor and the robustness, there's also the amount of data that you can store on one of these things. It actually stores data on it, but um, not too much. I put about enough for a URL, so like 40 characters maybe you could store on one of these things. <coughs> there's some that you can get even bigger. Are, are they ROMs or can you write them? Can you can, them? They're writable. They're writable. So these are really cool things. <laughs> you write some data to this and all of a sudden it's it's machine readable. There's no image processing required to, to, to get you know figure out what this is. How much do they cost? And what's the writer cost? Well, the phones that have the phones that have NFC capabilities can write. But that's another use case, like you walk up and, I don't know, and yeah. adds your data maybe to it or something like that. But, so like this phone can write in your It's like their dollar piece. About. It's kind of, kind of Also, like a uh, a notion of a secure, uh, I guess, like a secure s space that is used when you try to do NFC scanning to pay for something. Like a secure, like to do a secure transaction, you you can use um, you know, scan the phone. And that does an NFC scan, but it uses a special secure area. Please don't worry. Okay. 
you go around wiping out, yeah. wiping out people's kind of feet. So it's actually there's a lot of there's like a lot of little there's a little dance that has to go on between the phone and the tag to get everything to happen. But um, the key, a key part of it is just writing the data, right? So here's some code that's going to write a piece of data to one of these tags as JSON. Um, and it's kind of a bunch of gobbledygook. There's bytes involved, but what the, <laughs> what the main thing I've highlighted in, in red is the mime type. So I'm going to write, it's basically all the data I'm writing is the mime type. This is my custom, custom tag. And then in another part of the app, I take that same mime type and I put it here. And that, what that tells Android to do is anytime someone scans an NFC that has that mind type, activate my app. So once, once you do that, it's, you're ready to go. So why don't we do some IT asset tracking? Hmm. Uh, okay. So this, watch what happens when I do this. Don't fail me now. That says, ooh, it rotated. It says, um, retag and replace currently displayed information in the text field. Okay. So it read some data into there. And I can write. Uh, I can write it too. So let's see. Actually, my first computer had a lot less than that, but maybe two megahertz. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to push this button. It's going to go do a write, a writing sequence. Right. The first thing it has to do is wait, wait for a, a tag to get into range, and then it'll we'll do the write. Okay, a pre-formed <coughs> tag was successfully updated. So if I scan it again, that should come back. And there it is. doesn't have to, this is, it's still, it's still not realize, this sample app is not realizing like, the awesomeness of doing NFC stuff. I'm still like turning on the app and I'm, like, manipulating and stuff. You can actually trigger, trigger the, the, the NFC stuff like from the home screen. Right, so let's see, I want to, want to move on to my my concluding demo, which is going to be a combination of NFC scanning slash speech. So you scan, you're in the kitchen, you grab your phone, you scan the NFC, and the phone says, what, how much time do you want on your timer? You say five minutes, and you go back to the kitchen. Right? And then it notifies you when, when the timer goes up. <coughs> is that worth the 99 cent download? Uh, <laughs> okay. So I've already set this up. So let's see. I'm on the I'm on the home screen here, and if I scan this, how long should I set? How long should I set the timer? Five minutes. Set timer for five. Thank you very much. Okay, so can you see? Oh, you see it. So now I have a timer going off, right? In five minutes, it's going to, to uh, tell you when things have gone off. So that's the kind of potential I see with the NFC it's like from the home screen without much interaction. Get triggered. Or something. 
Well, how many androids actually have uh, NFC scanners built in? A handful, I would say. There's the Nexus line, and then there's the Galaxy, right? The Galaxy has it. Once there's an iPhone that has NFC scanning, it'll become mainstream, most likely. <laughs> How much power does it draw to have this NFC scanner running basically 24-7? Not much apparently. I just read it on Facebook. Oh. Well, there's dedicated hardware for it, so... It doesn't run when the phone's off, so this phone's off, not running right now. You mean sleeping or off? Well, it's, it's, it's locked. Okay, it's so sleeping. So I don't know if I unlock, if I just turn on the screen, it will do it. It's saying because of the slow speed and short range, it doesn't need a powerful radio. Um, so as little power as possible, so that it can be left on at all times, not affect the phone's battery by that much. But then you get specific ways to quantify it. One minute. So it's the same kind of technology, it, like you, you step into a car and it, it unlocks the doors and you, you walk up to a car and it, uh, Could be. I think a Prius is out. Could be, yeah. My car has a Google wallet. Google yeah. wallet. Hmm. Do you have to register, um, like certain mind type to start a certain app or can any app, like I write an app that would just dump data from any uh, tag it saw or would it, once I scan a tag that had your like mind type, would it open up your app to say? You can, or you can um, write an app that'll respond to any scan okay. at all. There's a, there's a whole way to specify exactly what kind of mm -hmm. tags you want the app to respond to. So you have to, to register to something with some service, some data to try. Is it like the yeah, hands where like, it'll then Google will pop up a thing, like you want to open this with app A or app B kind of a thing? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Time or done? Yeah, it will do that. It will do that. But again, if you get this custom NFC tag that I wrote, like, mm -hmm. if you don't know what's in, what the data is, then you already kind of, but there's kind of like standard, there's also some standards, like, mm -hmm. this is a tag with a URL in it, right. like, that kind of right. stuff. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. So you said there's some that are read only, so presumably like random hazard bias can override the data? So you wouldn't be able to write that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you buy the tags from? Oh, that's my mom. Purchase an OC sticker and there's a bunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tag stand, I got these from. Okay, okay. why don't we, uh, once you come back up, and we'll answer some more questions. Or, oh, I'll just plug our library. <laughs> so, all the code that I've been talking about and much more fun stuff is on GitHub. And of course, this is our app, the app we've been playing with all along. We can track your IT assets. Mm -hmm. um, contact info, and I have more demos if you want. If you want to go on. But, um, does anyone have any other questions for Adam or I? Well, going back to the voice, I think you have to know, but you can't train certain words, can you, to, to Google to recognize? For example, bizarrely named Massachusetts towns like Peabody <laughs> or <coughs> April, no. which is crazy. Right. You're kind of screwed. That's why that's why I have this, this is an algorithm that you have to use. You know, like uh, other speech recognizers, you write grammar, and then that would, that would give the hints to the speech recognizer. If you're going to say Peabody. Um, I think I think it was uh, Greg who was saying that when the machine is busy, Time or done. <laughs> Thank you very much. when the machine is busy, it can like miss samples and things like that, or, or something like that. Do you have any control over like priority? Can you say this is a high priority for foreground app? You know, for sensors. Slow, yeah, slow everything down so I can like capture these samples or whatever. Not that I can tell. It <clears throat> doesn't mean it's not that. It just may not come across. And not that I can Okay. Generally speaking, the sample, the sample is so high that uh, I, 
I've really tried to push it. I haven't lost it. It's just something to sort of say they're not. Until today. Okay. Yeah. It's it's really easy to get started if you know Java. Do you have the clapper with you? Clapper? The clapper prototype? Okay. Okay. This one, yeah, this one was going to make me a million dollars someday. Okay, so.
Clap. Is anyone hearing the theme song? In the head? <laughs> the problem is this isn't very useful. It's just fun. Hey! So instead of listening for claps, you know, it might be more interesting to listen for a particular keyword. So, you know, if I say Rumpelstiltskin, then, you know, so certain app launches. Is it possible to register with an API and say, when you hear the word Rumpelstiltskin, launch my app, and then just let it run in the background while, you know, the phone is doing something else? Yes. Yes? Is it possible? Yes, watch. That's what this button is supposed to be. Um, and I start it. So up here, I don't know. Up here is kind of there's an icon um, where behind the scenes I'm running the speech recognition over and over and over and over, and over, and over again. And yeah, but your app is in the foreground. I mean, when your app isn't, yeah, like, okay. isn't I, can, I can take it off the foreground. And I'm still listening. Hello. Say a test phrase. The current time is January 16, 2013, 8.44, 26 p.m. So I was, I was off the screen, right? I could be off browsing the web or, or whatever. This kind of interaction is interesting, but I'm not sure how robust it is at the, at the moment. It's, it keeps beeping. Do you, do you hear the beeping? Yeah. That, that, that it just, it automatically does it. There's no control. <laughs> also, you're, you're sending data continually to Google. Yeah. Hello. So I don't know if Google will, like, just start throttling me at some point. Mm. Well, you could just only send when, you could do some kind of local recognition, at least with speech, and then only send when there's something to send. It can get tricky. Yep. Another thing I've done is the uh, the next greatest thing you're going to need in every uh, meeting that you would. Oh, it's on this one. It's called Auto Transcriber. Um, oops. Oh, I'm trying to get my daughter's opera on there. Oh, well. So that's supposed to run the speech recognizer continually in the background and log all everything it heard to the text file. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of these like, you know, half finished kind of things. <laughs> you record all your favorite recipes, right? Ah, uh, well yeah, I haven't shown the recipes. The recipes though. All right. Thank you. Mine stay buried because I'm so happy. Huh? You, you have some, but they're not. <laughs> no, we're showing. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.